Scott, so thanks for jumping on, joining us for this. The key thing that we talked about hitting during this discussion is uh, Denali as being the continuation to the progression I've been talking over the past few weeks uh, from less technical to more technical mountains and higher altitude mountains. Um, but first, uh, if you could introduce yourself um, and what you do and your background on the mountain. Sure. Well, um, my name is Scott Johnston. Um, I've been a climber since I was a kid. I started climbing in high school and um, I'm now almost 70. Uh, although I don't climb as much as I used to, I still do get out. And um, I had a pretty extensive um, career as a, you know, as an amateur. Of course, I was working other jobs, but I was a uh, uh, amateur alpinist. I climbed, climbed all over the world, Himalayas, Karakoram, uh, lots in Europe, Canada, Alaska. So I have a pretty extensive climbing background myself. I also um, have coached a number of elite um, alpinists, uh, one of them being Steve House, with whom I co-authored um, a couple of books, one being Training for the New Alpinism and one being Training for the Uphill Athlete. Some of you might be familiar with those. Um, they have a pretty uh, extensive di deep dive into training theory, principles, methods, and all of that stuff for mountain athletes. So, and I, and I have spent a fair bit of time um, on Denali. Uh, I don't, don't know exactly how many times I've climbed it, you know, maybe less than 10, but um, I've climbed four different routes on Denali. Um, one of them, the West Buttress, a few times. Um, and one of them was uh, a new route that I soloed um, until we found, this is back in the 70s, remember, before, well, long before the internet and information didn't spread like it does now. There was no Instagram to brag yeah. about routes you'd done. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we discovered um, after, uh, actually, it was actually published in magazines back then, Mountain and Climbing Magazine published this as a first descent of a new route. And then it turned out we discovered a year later that Reinhold Messner had soloed it the year before I did, but didn't tell anybody. So, um, but I guess they got to get one upped by somebody that's not a bad person to get one upped by. Um, so, anyway, that's my background with, you know, in general and, and specifically with regards to Denali. Yeah. Well, so, a lot of people, I imagine, go to Denali once to decide it's a horrible place, from what I've heard, uh, mm -hmm. for some people, and then don't ever go back. So why did you go back? Um, because it was, you know, well, it's an, it's an amazing mountain, and the Alaska range is really incredible, and I would recommend people go there. It's an opportunity to get to, you know, essentially 6,000 meters here in North America, you know, not, not having to, you know, fly to some other continent and spend a huge amount of money to do it. So it's relatively easy for us. Um, and it's, uh, I found my first trip to the Himalayas um, where I did the, um, the third legal ascent of Amadablam, the first alpine ascent of Amadablam, legal, um, and it had been pirated once by Reinhold Messner and once by Jeff Lowe. You know, it had, but it, before it had actually been on the permit list. The Amadablam was late before it was late that the uh, Nepalese decided to allow people to climb on it. Um, so anyway, when I went there, and Amadablam is a bit over six thousand meters. I can't remember. It's twenty almost 23,000 feet, I think. And I remember thinking to myself on the summit of Amma de Blom going, ooh, I think Denali feels higher than this. Um, you know, we did a pretty rapid ascent. We were only, you know, took, we were on the mountain three days, um, but we were fairly well acclimatized when we did it. But it, And you probably know the, con the concept of equatorial bulge in the atmosphere that should in theory, and I'm, I think it probably does, I don't, I've never read any studies about the barometric pressures, but it makes sense to me that the atmosphere bulges around the equator due to the rotation of the earth and that the atmosphere is thinner at, uh, in higher latitudes. And so Denali at 20,000, I think even someone as famous as Doug Scott once said that 
Denali is the equivalent of about 24,000 in the Himalayas. So it's a chance to really get to quite high altitude or experience what it's like to be at quite high altitude without having to do a major expedition to you know, halfway around the world and a third world country. So that was a lot of the appeal. Um, and it was a place to test myself and prove to myself that I could go on to other things. Yeah, you're you're definitely not the only person that has noticed the potential altitude difference. I know Colin Haley on his blog has commented on it uh, before as well as Denali feeling like it's higher than it's uh, just over 20,000 feet. Yeah, um, huh. yeah. when you're there, you'll notice it. And I think maybe it's something to do with the cold air, you know, that you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's a harsh environment. I mean, it's almost an you know, Arctic environment compared to the Himalayas, which are at you know, very low latitude and almost, except for the fact that they've got these enormous glaciers, that you know, the weather can be almost tropical on some of those glaciers at times. And, and it's very rare to have, you know, you'll have hot days on the glaciers on Denali, but um, it it's, it's generally feels more Arctic. Yeah. And you in your business, train a lot of people who are looking at progressing from wherever they're at to some bigger mountains. And I imagine that's a large portion of your clientele. I'm curious, yeah. like looking at, say, a client that has maybe done one to a dozen 14, like 14,000 foot mountains in the US, what would you recommend and what have you seen be successful as a progression towards a mountain like Denali or I'm a Dablon that's more technical. Um, yeah, you're right. And I guess I should, I should have said, I wasn't thinking about this. Maybe I have an opportunity to mention that, yeah, I do run a coaching business called Evoke Endurance. I used to be a partner um, at uh, Uphill Athlete, which I left a few months ago and started a new business with most of the coaches. So yeah, we that are probably 70% of our clientele are people that are preparing to climb a big mountain, usually a big glaciated mountain. Sometimes it's you know something like Baker, Rainier, um, uh, and and obviously Denali and bigger ones. But um, so in terms of the progression, I know the way I progressed was growing up in Boulder, Colorado. I climbed a lot extensively in the Colorado Rockies. And that was my exposure to altitude. And I didn't, I was young, didn't really understand progression very well. Um, and my first trip to Denali was in 1976. Um, and we climbed the Muldrow Glacier route, which is a very long um, way to get up the mountain. But if you ever want to go there, I recommend it because you're going to be really isolated. It will not be, it's not a crowd scene over there. Um, but anyway, I, we had, and it's such a long route that it allowed us to fully acclimate. I don't think I really understood the, um, the dangers of rapid ascents to high altitude and going from, you know, only really being accustomed to, to climbing up to 14,000 feet and then suddenly you know, going to a mountain that's 20,000 feet, because the, the, the whole approach is so long and gradual, we, I didn't really notice it. And, um, and I think that, you know, one, but one of the, I'll, I'll give this caveat that I learned kind of the hard way um, is growing up in Colorado, you're, you're dealing with high mountains, but they start pretty high. You know, they're generally the roots are relative are short in terms of total overall length in terms of, you know, as a, as big mountains go. And so you get accustomed to getting up and off the roots, even you know, some of the harder, you know, more technical routes in Rocky Mountain National Park or, um, is that, you know, they're day climbs. They're, they're things that you can, you know, sleep in your own bed the night before and be home for dinner that day even you know, some of the more challenge one, challenging ones. So you get lulled into this sense that, oh, I've climbed these 14ers, four there's, um, you know, I'm ready. And I got spanked pretty hard my first trip to the Canadian Rockies where we went and climbed a, a very difficult route on um, the uh, Mount Robson, which we thought, oh, it's only 12,000 feet. How, how big a deal can that be? Well, the route we climbed is almost 10,000 vertical feet. Um, we, uh, we were on the emperor Ridge and the rock quality got so bad up high, we ended up having to traverse out onto the emperor face and to finish and finish the route, um, up the emperor face, 
which is no small thing. And and we had we thought we're we're really good, strong rock climbers and good alpine climbers. We climbed with one 50 meter, eight millimeter rope, two ice screws, two pitons, and two uh, two nuts, two stoppers. And on this 10,000 foot route, well, you can imagine that that got really sketchy. Yeah, it and then sounds like off. you have yeah. limited options with that rack. Yeah, and then we got then we had to get off of it. So it ended up being, uh, you know, it, we we did fine, and we it, it was a great learning experience. But I do think there is a tendency. I've seen this. I'm going to say this as a Colorado climber. There is a tendency for Colorado climbers to think they've got it all dialed because they they have this amazing playground to climb in, and then they go to some bigger ranges elsewhere and kind of overshoot what they're capable of. So I think that's an important thing to know about Alaska. It's big. You know, I've, I've known really good climbers who got out of the airplane at the base camp on the Cahiltna, took one look at that 10,000 foot south face of Denali and said, uh, uh, I'm not doing this and, and left, frankly. It's, so it's, it's important when you go to a place of to Denali, I think to have re real good respect for what you're going to be getting yourself into. Yeah. I mean, the, the only mountain I can really think of in the lower 48 that has that sort of scale of elevation gain is really Rainier where it's like 10 yeah. K from where you start to the summit. Right. And, and that's, that I, is when we have clientele clients, excuse me, that are interested in progressing to Denali, we always have them come to the North Cascades and you know, to a progression from Baker to Rainier before they go to Denali. They also, those are the only true massively glaciated peaks in you know the lower 48, where you're going to have to deal with real glacier hazards. You know, there aren't any other mountains in the lower 48 that really have big crevasse hazards and that's where you're going to be living on, on snow and ice when you're, so it's the great training grounds. And many of the guide services that operate on, um, on Denali will have training camps where they'll bring the clients to Denali for a week and um, run programs with them there so they can become accustomed to what it's going to be like when they hit the ground. Yeah. So can you talk more about the progress, like the ideal progression you would like to see your clients go through and why? Or you yourself? Know, yeah. The, well, the first thing I think is fitness. I mean, Denali is, a, you're, you're, especially if you do it with a, a guide service, you're essentially a pack animal on, on those, that route. But the, the, the West Buttress is a pretty, it's quite non-technical. Um, there's one steep section that has fixed ropes, you know, that head wall from 14 to 16. Um, but even that it's, you know, the ski, I've skied it, it's, you know, maybe 40 degrees and um, in the right conditions, it's perfectly skiable. And so you, there's, you know, you can climb Denali with a ski pole, essentially. And so it's not that technical, but it's physically a lot of work. And especially if you're with a guide service, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So a few years ago, the National Park Service in uh, Denali National Park decided that for, because of rescue situations, that guides, guide services can only have their clients on snowshoes and as opposed, as opposed to skis. Private parties can come on skis and using skis on a glacier is so much more efficient than being on snowshoes. So if you're going to be with a guide service, you're just going to be doing a lot more work because walking on snowshoes is more tiring than, than skinning uphill on skis. And, and you'll be ferrying loads, as you probably know, your ferry loads between camps. <clears throat> and with snowshoes, you have to turn around and spend basically, because the glacier is not very steep, you know, it takes you two or two or three hours to go up the hill to the, drop, your, drop a load at the next camp. Well, it's going to take you two or three more hours to get back down to the lower camp. Whereas if you were on skis, it might take you 15 minutes of just easily gliding down the glacier. So there's a substantially higher workload for guided parties <clears throat> on snowshoes. So that I think is one of the things that makes fitness a really big factor for people who are going to be climbing Denali. <clears throat> um, the acclimatization is usually slow enough that most people do pretty well with it. Um, with the, the snowshoe method? 
Well, just with, I'm sorry, I meant with altitude. They can, they handle the altitude because it's a very gradual, the, the, the lower part of the Cahilton Glacier is quite low angle. So you have, mm. you know, several days a week to get kind of acclimated up to 14,000 feet. Now, if you live at sea level, you have to bear, understand that you're going to be flying into 7,000 feet. So, and this one possible scenario that we help people with is that, let's say you live in Florida and you're going to climb Denali. And you might think, okay, I'm going to fly into Talkeetna, and then maybe I literally that you you end up in Talkeetna. You like so you're not flying to Talkeetna, so you take a train or drive to Talkeetna, and you show up at four in the afternoon, and the pilot says, "Hey, we're flying in an hour. Get all your crap ready to go and throw it in the airplane, and we're going." So you're going to be in from Florida in the morning to seven thousand feet on a glacier that afternoon, um, that is a huge shock to your system. So I recommend that people who are coming from very low elevations, who, um, that they try to get pre-acclimatized somehow. Um, you can use you know, a hypoxico tent or something like that, but because starting that trip off unacclimatized and then the first day having to do a bunch of hard work, the trip can go very badly downhill after that. So acclimatization is a huge factor <clears throat> and, then, and then fitness. But progression wise, I think, you know, when you can gain the fitness, you know, on a stair machine, you know, you don't have to be in the mountains to gain the fitness, but in terms of learning the technical skills and learning to be comfortable on like snow camping, you're going to be living on a glacier for, you know, two or three weeks. So being able to do, I think we try to get people to go winter camping and just learn, you know, get your, your gear, your gear stuff sorted out. So you know what it's like to live in snow, have to deal with, you know, frozen boots in the morning and you know, cooking and, and melting snow, all of those kind of skills that they don't seem very important, but end up being kind of critical to your enjoyment factor. Try to gain those, but I do recommend people get on a big, you know, glaciated mountain like Baker or Rainier at some point. Yeah. And just to put some numbers to it, as you were talking, Scott, I did a quick um like profile of the west buttress route and so it's right just under fourteen thousand feet of total elevation gain from mm -hmm. the hilton airport or the yeah. hilton glacier airport uh to the summit um over 14 and a half miles and that's a, yeah. again a very general route but i think putting those numbers to it adds some perspective what's that a thousand feet a mile then right uh just and, yeah just under a thousand feet a mile yeah and um so that's less than 20 percent grade for as an average yep. and most of the gradient you know it's going to have it has one short steep section where most of that elevation is gain a 2000 foot gain um you know very short distance so a lot of it is going to be in the you know 10 to 15 percent gra uh, gradient range so it's not very steep in most of it yeah right on so looking at like now we've talked progression a little bit um and what uh has your experience on the mountain been uh let's start with the west buttress well i think in i'll make one general statement is that the mountain doesn't really start to show its um character until you get to fourteen thousand feet that's where it gets starts to get real um, down below that, you will have, you know, warm days, you know, on the glacier, maybe in t-shirts even, and hanging around and thinking, well, what the heck, this doesn't seem like such a big deal. Why are people always talking about how scary and dangerous Denali is? But from 14,000 feet up, it becomes suddenly, you know, a, a different kind of a mountain. The, you won't be wearing a t-shirt <clears throat> at 16,000 feet, you know, unless there's something really strange happening. Um, you the storms you know the, the kind you'll deal with storms perhaps lower on the glacier but they're not going to be very severe at all and in fact they may just be wet soggy snow and you might be stuck in a tent for a day because you literally sometimes the weather moves in you can't see um you know 10 feet you can't really see the tent next to you and as a consequence it gets it's really dangerous to be moving around on a glacier when you can't see the to the terrain it's easy to i mean even if you have a gps you can't you often see the crevasses. So the, the weather down below is, is kind of an inconvenience, but not dangerous. When you get above, get 14 and above, it gets dangerous. When the storms blow in, 
that's when you know you can easily have 100 plus mile an hour winds and um you know sub-zero temperatures for days on end i my first trip on um the west buttress in 1976 where me and a buddy two buddies we drove a like a 1960 Land Rover, short wheelbase Land Rover from Boulder, Colorado to Denali National Park, you know, top speed is about 45 miles an hour. And we did all this because we didn't have any money. We couldn't afford to fly in. So Sounds like a short in. drive. Yeah, it was, it was weeks. It was harder than the climb, I think. But then we, then it's a 25 mile approach across the tundra to get to the Muldrow Glacier. And then it's another 20 some miles up that glacier to the summit. And so for, long per, for perspective, where on the mountain is the Muldrow Glacier? Like what cardinal direction? So that comes off the north side of okay. the of the glacier of the mountain, and um, that was the route of the first ascent. The, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the 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 sourdoughs who actually planted a flagpole on the north summit, thinking because it's then it could be they had a bet that that they would be able to climb the mountain. These were guys who were you know tough dogs. They sledded in from Fairbanks in the winter time, <laughs> then ended up carrying a flagpole all the way up that you know across the tundra up they took dog sleds to 14,000 feet and then carried the flagpole to the summit and went back and then when they got to the summit they realized oh this summit's actually lower than the south summit but they didn't go over to climb the south summit anyway what happened to us is at about 16,000 um, feet we got pinned down in a three-day storm and luckily we had we had dug snow caves <clears throat> but the wind was so strong that the roof of the cave was drumming I mean, and we were literally pinned in that cave with, you know, I'm, I'm sure well over 100 mile an hour winds for three days. So the weather's serious above there. Luckily, nowadays, it's easy to get good weather forecasts, you know, almost 100% accuracy for the next 24 to 48 hours. So it's easy to plan what you're going to do once you get above 14. But once you get above 14, that's like a real mountain up there. And um, so I think that that's one thing that's important to understand. You want to minimize your time above 14. One of the things that I have striven for with athletes I've coached who I know are fit enough is to go from 14 to the summit and back down in a day. I believe that's the most, the safest way to climb that mountain, honestly. Um, <clears throat> most of the guide services will establish a camp between 14 and, and the summit at 17.2, which is it's a lot of work to carry a whole camp's worth of stuff up to 17. And then you're spending a night at a really high altitude that's going to make you probably not sleep very well. And then the next day, you're going to have a long day up to the summit. And what I have found with athletes I've coached is these are you can't do that with most guide services. If you had a private guide, you could do it. But most guide services, the fitness level of the general party won't be high enough to do this. But if you're climbing as a private individual, you have this opportunity, if you're fit, to wait for that 24-hour forecast where you know it's going to be perfectly sunny. Um, Colin Hale, I've done this actually several times. I did it once with Colin as an acclimatization before we went to the Cassine Ridge. Um, was we waited till we had a good weather window and we literally did not even have packs. I think we might've had a, like a fanny pack with a water bottle in it. <clears throat> and um, we went round trip in about six and a half hours from 14 to the summit and back down. And, um, and because we didn't have any weight, so we had carrying nothing. And so it was a pleasurable, fun day out. Um, we waited until the sun hit us came, the sun came around it was nice and warm so we didn't have to have warm really very warm clothes we had a down parka and a, that was about it each and um there's even a picture i think of colin on that on that day um in the training for the new alpinism but to me that's the safest way you know on any big yeah. mountain the, the, the faster you can get up and back down the less chances you have for thing bad things happening yeah. What would you say is fit? Like if we were to put numbers or metrics to it, what would you say is fit enough to do that bigger day from 14 to summit? I think to that's at low elevations and by low elevations, I would say, you know, 6,000 feet and below. So let's say you, where you live on your home turf, if you can climb a thousand meters in an hour, you are you know, with no load. I'm not talking about with a pack on or anything else, running shoes, you know, in your home turf, and you're capable of ascending a thousand feet an hour, then you are plenty fit enough to go 14 to the summit and back. And that's, you know, a thousand feet an hour is no easy task, 
but it's a guarantee. I can almost guarantee you, if you can do that, you could, you well, you're definitely fit enough. But even people who might be somewhat less than that probably can do it because what happens to a lot of folks is they get to, two things bad happen. You go to 17 and then the weather changes and then you're pinned down at 17 for three days. And in each one of those, you're sleeping worse and worse each night. You're not acclimated. You're losing your strength. And then the day you're supposed to go to the summit, you're so wasted from having spent three nights at 17 that you know the summit's not even an option or you drag barely able to make the summit um, or people get sick from spending two or three days there, um, start to get altitude, you know, acute mountain sickness, um, or the weather never clears up and you run out of supplies and you have to go down. So there's some pretty significant inherent risk at spending time at that higher altitude. Yeah, so a, th a thousand meters per hour unloaded at like 5,000 feet elevation and below. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then what would, because th that would say like, oh, from 14 to 20, that means I can do it in two hours, right? So what, well, what would the actual translation <laughs> look like? Well, I think it took Colin and I, well, I said it was about six and a half, I think, round trip. Um, <clears throat> I bet, I, I don't remember timing it, but I bet it was, you know, four hours, four or five hours up. And then we ran most of the way down, actually. Sure. Um and uh, and I, if you're going to do it that way, I recommend you do it, you know, leave camp after the sun has hit you at around 10 in the morning. And because, you know, in June, it's almost 24 hour daylight. So that way we were climbing up in the sun all day. And then the sun, the but the, the buttress faces west. So you're coming down into the sun on the way down. And so that's why you can sneak, you can get away with nothing but a day pack with, you know, some water and a little bit of snacks and a down parka. Um, I know this will probably sound radical to people and maybe we'll get, you're going to get in trouble for even having me on your show, but um, I've climbed it a number of times that way. And I've even known people, I've taken people who had very little mountaineering experience. Um, as some people might know, I used to coach uh, World Cup cross country skiers. Well, I've taken some of those World Cup cross country skiers and said, I want to go climb Denali. And they're super fit, but they don't have much mountaineering experience. And they'll have no problem skiing up to 14 because it's pretty darn gentle terrain um, for most of the way. They have to take their skis off for a little bit. But then I knew all they had to do was race to the summit and back in one day, and they could easily do that. So I have, I've actually worked with quite a few people that have done that if their fitness is high enough. Awesome. And then like one of the things that I've noticed is that there's sort of two schools of thought when it comes to what your safety margin looks like. And I, I'll guess I can call it the European versus American version. European being like speed equals safety, American version being like weight equals safety and things yeah. equal safety. Yeah. So it's like from the American perspective in that uh, structure sounds like you're taking a lot of risk by going so light. So why make that decision? Um, well, two reasons. One is ethical. Uh, you might remember Reinhold Messner used to have a, he had a saying that was quite popular when he, I think it was in one of his books that I remember being struck by it when I was a young man begin, getting into climbing that said, you can carry your courage in your rucksack. <clears throat> and I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. They think, well, I'm going to be okay because I have my bivy gear with me. Well, that can sometimes get you into a position where you should have turned tail and run and gone down at the first sign of that bad weather, rather than going, oh, let's continue up because I have bivy gear and then getting stuck in a storm. I've, I've known, I can count three or four people I know that were, have been killed that way by making that choice that they think they had enough gear to survive. Whereas if you're out there with very little gear, you know you don't have a lot of options. So if if something, I mean, it, it, you you wouldn't. I'm not suggesting people do that on a on a dangerous route. But I don't consider you know there's nothing technically difficult <clears throat> or potentially very dangerous on done on Denali at that elevation, except the weather. So if you know the weather's going to be good and you have the fitness, then you're actually I think running less risk doing it this way. You do still need, you know, if one of the first of your partner starts to get, you know, dis displaying, you know, um, altitude sickness, then you have to have the judgment to say, oh, it's not happening today. We're going down. Maybe you go back down to 14, at which point your partner recovers in a day or two when you rest up and you can try again. 
Um, but I think it instills more judgment in people if they're more um, lightly equipped. They're more likely to, I think, go home and come back another day rather me, than put themselves out there. What I'm hearing is like, it's committing to your plan instead of like committing to like being six quote unquote successful at all costs yeah. Yeah. and like committing to the plan is potentially a safety measure because it allows you to make a different decision when the stress levels rise and things don't go as planned. Which, as you know, and probably all of you are familiar with, in the mountain and big mountains, especially, things often don't go to plan. It's like you were you mentioned, I think, in one of your other talks about um, von Clausewitz, who said, you know, then as soon as the battle starts, all the plans go out the window. I can't remember the exact quote. You you probably do, but yeah, it went. Um, now I'm blanking on it. Now you put me on the spot, and I just said <laughs> it like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, the point yeah. is that in real world in real situation you can plan and plan and plan but those plans will could easily just become meaningless at, at the first first time they you have to yeah, it's it's no plan survives there. first contact with the enemy in this case like in the mountains i call the enemy reality yeah mm -hmm. and i i climbed with that ethic through virtually all of my you know long climbing career um with going light and being willing to to go home and i survived a lot of scary things i learned a lot doing it but I, I, one of the main things i learned was failing gracefully yeah. and i've written actually an essay about that in training for the new alpinism that i think it's something that more people need to understand and embrace is that you know you can go home and come back another day if you, you know whereas if you push your limits I'm not a fan of that. I don't, you know, unless you know, and there'll be such, there'll be plenty of situations where you'd be forced to push your limits, like mm -hmm. that case on Mount Robson where we got ourselves in over our heads. But in many cases, I think it's better. You might have a higher failure rate. I'm sure that my my big mountain climbing success, I can tell you that I'm batting zero on 8,000 meter peaks. Um, but uh, you know, my big mountain climbing success is probably in the 20 to 30 percent range. Uh, if that even, yeah. um, because I've been willing to go light, try to go fast, be safe and go home if I failed. Yeah, I believe it was Wojtek Kurtica, if I remember correctly, that says, don't epic, keep it in control. Yeah, that was unfortunately Uli Steck. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, sadly. Yep. Yeah, Uli was killed. Um, but he did try to subscribe to that. But climbing the way Uli did, it was, um, unfortunately, I'm yep. afraid it was only a matter of time. Right. Yeah. And like with the, like creating a plan and going light, like this summer, um, you could call me going up Grand Teton being a failure. Cause I didn't make it to the summit and like that yet you also called it like the best week of training we've potentially had together because mm -hmm. two days before I went up Long's peak in four and a half hours, car to car with a friend and then went to Grand Teton a day later and had a turnaround time of five and a half hours. I ended up getting behind uh, several parties who were just moving super slow, couldn't pass them, didn't feel comfortable passing yeah. them with the wind. Uh, so I turned around just yeah. at, just after the crux of that route. <laughs> um, yeah. And it and went back down because I, I hit my time and I had, a, I had a fanny pack with 500 milliliters of water and a water filter and then like a few calories and that to me from a, because i'm a light and fast kind of guy from an ethical standpoint i would enjoy that day much more than i would have had you know, had i gone up there with you know prepared for you know to spend the night or something and and had to spend the night or climb very slowly behind those people i had an uncomfortable bivouac coming down because it was they were slow. I'll give you a, another example of this in an even more extreme situation. I coach a professional alpinist named um, David Gothler. Um, German is not that well known in this country, but he's a pretty big deal in Europe. And um, last year, a bit, Dave has been trying to climb um, Everest without oxygen. He's made three attempts. <clears throat> 
finally succeeded this year. One of the attempts was a speed ascent with uh, Killian Journey last year, where they both realized they on their speed ascent, they both kind of looked at each other and said, I'm not feeling it, you know, something, we're not feeling that great right now. So they turned around and went down. And this was after, you know, quite a bit of publicity and it was a big deal. And yet they just said, okay, not happening. And then this two, a couple of years before that, before the pandemic hit, um, David went up there to climb. And it was the year that maybe it was like 2019 or something. And there was a huge traffic jam. People might remember the pictures of this line of folks below the summit of, of Everest. Yeah, the, the photo was, that like Nims Die made popular in, his, in yes. his thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, David was up there without oxygen. You don't, you can't spend that much time there. And he was, he gets, he could get around some of the people and he got to within, um, I think he was 70 meters below the summit. And he said, I'm getting, I'm going to get too cold, especially going down. If I get stuck behind some of these people at some of the rappel places. So he turned around 70 meters below the summit of Everest, um, rather than risk it. And I think, you know, being willing to make those kind of hard calls is, is really important. I mean, the judgment is what keeps you alive in these kind of situations. Especially when you have like in the case of Everest, where the typical cost is about $80,000 for yeah, that trip. And I know that um, like one of the organizations that you've referred people to in the past and that I've worked with, um, Alpenglow, the founder, Adrian Ballinger, like they make sure that somebody has climbed another 8,000 meter peak because it's cheaper to mm -hmm. do another 8,000 meter peak and then go to Everest than it is to fail on Everest and do it again. Try to do it again. Yeah, they they like many of the good guide services request require that same sort of progression, like we were talking about in preparation for for Denali. They require similar sort of preparation before they'll even sign you up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's, if you're open to it, let's talk some of the the routes that you did on Denali, and more specifically, um, what is one challenge that you faced and lesson you learned as a result on one of those routes um let's see well maybe i could i can kind of give a quick overview of all of them in that first sure. one in 1976 <clears throat> when you know we did this because we didn't think we had enough we we're pretty sure we didn't have enough money to fly onto the glacier so we did this long approach and walk it was my first real expedition, you know, multi-day, multi-week expedition. And it was a huge learning experience about packing things. We thought we were being very clever, for instance, in packing our food. We went to the Coors factory and got these empty Coors, you know, case boxes. Thought, well, we'll pack our food in this. And we put them in plastic bags inside the cardboard box so the food would stay dry. Well, the cardboard boxes fell apart. You know, they get wet down low on the glacier. It rains or it's nasty warm weather and it's wet. So the, the, the food boxes fell apart. And then we had trouble carrying all this stuff. Um, you know, we, I was so poorly equipped. There's a picture I have at some point I'll share on my current website of me. I was, I was using my school book bag was my pack for the summit climb. You know, it's the same one I carried to school with me. Um, I just didn't have the gear. You know, we were using hemp, not hemp, but gold line ropes. We weren't mm -hmm. even using Kern mantle ropes. Um, and, and yeah, we made it, you know, we were fit, we were strong, we were, you know, enthusiastic. We climbed both summits, North Summit and South. Um, and so that was a good, that was it for me. That was a part of that progression. I, I got, gave me the confidence to know, oh, I can be out here for weeks at a time and survive and get this done and, um, have a great trip. Um, the, the next time I went was a couple of years later, and that's when I soloed this route. Um, and, uh, I was by myself, com almost completely on the mountain in those days, there were very, the guiding business was much, much smaller. There weren't any guided groups. Um, I had come to climb, uh, to try to do the first descent of the North buttress of Mount Hunter with a, a partner, a friend of mine from Boulder. And it was a very snowy year and the route was just too dangerous. We attempted it three different times, um, and ended up backing off each time. Mark Twight went back later and climbed the route that we were attempting and called it Desperation, uh, which was a, probably a pretty good name for it. Um, 
anyway, so my partner got decided he wanted to leave and he left uh, because the route was non-climbable. And I thought, well, heck, we're, I'm here on the glacier. I'm going to go do something. And um, I didn't have a permit for Denali, but I just put all my stuff in my backpack and I was on little cross country skis, uh, three pin bindings and skied up to 14. And there was nobody, there was no one in at 14. There was a few tents and I was all alone. Um, and I hung out there and I saw this route. It was a beautiful climb. It's now called the Messner Coolwar. Um, and I thought, wow, that's a great looking line. And um, I knew where the West Buttress went, but that looked kind of mundane compared to this. And so I hung out there, waited for a day or two. There was a storm and then that, that, the route avalanched. So I thought, oh, it's gonna be really safe. Um, I left at midnight. I had one liter of water and two baby roots with me. And um, I had one ice ax and um, climbed to the summit and was back about 10 in the morning. And that's when I, that was another one of those experiences where it was, I went, oh, you can do this kind of thing. Um, you know, it, it was a pretty committing thing for me to do at that time, a stage in my climbing career, not an extremely technically difficult route. Um, you know, it's about 5,000 feet and I think it averages about 45 degrees. So there's some bulges, 50 or 60 degrees. It's been skied several times now in the right conditions it can be skied. Um, but it's a massive route. And for me at that time, it was a huge undertaking, but it kind of, you know, opened my eyes to some possibilities and gave me a chance to, to learn some things there. One thing was <clears throat> your water bottle freezes. My, it was really cold that night when I started at midnight, uh, my water bottle and my baby roots candy bars froze. So I went the whole time without anything to eat. Um, another time I went with my wife, and this was a big mistake that I made that I think people can make. And this is a lesson I learned the hard way. And I still um, regret it to this day because it kept her from summiting. Um, <clears throat> she was plenty strong enough to summit. And that was, she's not as fit as I am. You know, I'm, I've been, I'm just, you know, guys generally were going to be stronger than women. She's much smaller than me. So carrying a heavy pack is harder, harder on her. <clears throat> so we, we went up the glacier to 14 at my pace, not her pace. Mm. And it wasn't ego. I wasn't trying to show her stuff because we do things all the time. I wasn't trying to show her how fit I was. I just didn't take into consideration the fact that she was working considerably harder than I was on that on the way to 14. Um, she's been, you know, she'd climbed Everest before this. So she, she was, you know, she knows what she's doing. Well, we got to 14 and she got really badly altitude sick because she'd been working just like five or 10% harder than yep. she should have been working. And this is where fitness for any of you listening, I think is such an important thing because if you can take it easy while you're acclimatizing, getting to 14 or anytime you're acclimatizing, you're going to have a much better chance of success. Whereas if you're pushing the pace to keep up with the group, there's a very good likelihood you're going to get acute mountain sickness, which is exactly what happened to her. And so we never even got above 14. I, we had to go down a couple of days, a day later. So that was a very valuable lesson to me that you need to travel at the pace of the slowest person in the group, not the fastest person in the group. Yeah. So just considering time, Scott, I'm going to ask yeah. one more question. And then for sure. those in the group, um, if you have questions, uh, you can post them in the chat. I'll probably get to one, maybe two of those, uh, before we, uh, hit time at nine o'clock at the latest. Uh, so one thing I'm curious about with that example with your wife is what did your pack weight, um, look like between the two of you? And was there a like consideration of body weight? Yeah, I definitely was carrying more. I was pulling a sled with mo a lot of weight in it, but it wasn't quite, and I don't know that it was the weight that was the problem. It was just the, the speed at which we were moving. Sure. Um, sure. And I didn't pay enough attention to that. Yeah, and the re reason I asked that is that's become something that some of the better units in the military are really focusing in on is like, what is the percentage of body weight that individual operators are carrying um, mm -hmm. to enable success? Because like, a 250 pound soldier should be able to carry more and should be carrying yeah. more than a 150 pound soldier. Yeah. Um, whereas Absolutely. like the sort of consistent thing the military goes to is just carry your weight. Everybody's going to have that hundred pound pack plus yeah. their 30 pounds of kit. 
and then no big yeah, deal, just deal with it. Unfortunately, the guide services use that same mentality. So you can have a hundred pound woman on a guided trip with a 180 pound man, and she's expected to carry the same load, which is ludicrous. I mean, it's, it's, it's unchivalrous. First of all, I'm an old fashioned guy. So I think, <laughs> um, but, it, you know, that, and it's also just logistically a bad idea because you're, you're actually lessening your chance for success because that person is likely to fail. And then you're going to have to deal with that, whatever the failure entails, you know, the, turning around and going down perhaps. Yeah. And for example, like the guest I had on this last week, Kim, she's a professional bodybuilder um, mm -hmm. and like happily carries an 80 pound pack at yeah. 150 pounds and five, two, but mm -hmm. that's not your standard fitness person. She also had, there's a death ride out here that has 15,000 feet of elevation gain during oh, yeah. a bike race. Like yeah. she's a masochist that loves that sort of stuff, but that is absolutely yeah. not your average uh, person climbing these mountains. Yeah. 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 I think that has to be taken into I wish the guide services took that into consideration, but from my experience and trying to prepare, and I have prepared quite a few women for Denali, that is a huge obstacle to overcome. Yeah. Right on. So I'm not seeing any uh, questions in the chat. So Scott, uh, one thing I'm after this, if you'd be open to it over the remainder of this week, just sitting down and outlining some of the routes you've done on Denali, mm -hmm. then I can post a map for the, like sure. what we talked about here. Um, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that way I can include that with the, the YouTube, um, you recording. Bet. Happy um, and that. then let's see, I, just, is there anything else you'd like to share at this point regarding Denali um, prep for it, um, or things you've learned? Yeah, I think that the thing I've the thing I've learned most. Um, I think I've already shared what I learned in my own experience, but my experience now is having having coached people for these big mountains for you know seven or eight years. Um, many of whom I feel came to us completely unprepared, no idea what they're getting themselves into, and it wasn't you know the fitness part is something that we have good means to prepare people for. But I think a lot of times people come into this, <clears throat> they've, you know, seen a picture of someone on a sunny summit and on a big mountain and think, oh, that's what I want to do. Don't understand the risks involved or you know, the, the technical skill levels that are involved. And so that's, I'm a big, a very big advocate of that whole progression. You know, you need to learn to be competent and comfortable, um, not only for your you know, safety, obviously, you want to be able to come home, but for your enjoyment, um, I mean, you're going to do this, hopefully, because, you know, you enjoy it and you want to have that. You better enjoy it because it's a lot of suffering. And, you know, there, I mean, climbing big mountains is about suffering for a long time. You're moving very slowly and suffering for a long time. And so you better enjoy that process. But uh, that's my one of my takeaways is I'm surprised at the number of people that come to me and us, our coaches, and say, I want to climb Mount Everest, and I've never had crampons on my feet. Um, I mean, literally, we've made a policy of, you know, four months minimum that we will coach, we will take someone on to coach them if they have big aspirations. And we push very hard to get them to reconsider, because we had, I literally had someone come three weeks before they were leaving for Everest and asking me to train them to get them in shape to climb Mount Everest. And they had that's, never climbed anything. That's in never going to work. No. And I think that there's just, it, it, I think it's whether it's social media and just the internet in general has downplayed the risk that's involved in a lot of this and, and the experience level in terms of what's needed and made it look like, well, I met this person at a cocktail party and they climbed Mount Everest and, you know, I should be able to do it too. Well, you probably could, but it's, you know, just have yeah proper perspective of what it takes yeah because i know i'm better smarter stronger than them like it, ego yeah. comes into a uh, oh, yeah. play there i imagine um just for and then for you scott like i'm gonna give you a little bit, bit of a plug because for perspective for people i have been training with scott now for about 18 months maybe a little bit more and it was specifically for military objective and then uh train like i've just ended up doing a lot of that training in the mountains as well and like i got fitter and i 
as a result, even though I'd been fit before. And like, I asked for help because I know I'm not the greatest at being consistent. I'm the greatest at like do, going really hard, getting burned out and then stopping for a while, uh, which so the biggest thing Scott has done for me is he's protected me from me or attempted to, I should say, uh, in that he's like pulled the reins and told me to slow down, which is exactly what I needed. Um, and so Scott, for you, if just to close this out, if you could plug uh, or where can people find you and what you're doing? Yeah, um, well, the, the the business that that I own and run with a number of the other coaches, it's coach owned, but we're kind of a collaborative um, is called Evoke Endurance. Um, we don't show up very well in Google searches, so you're actually going to have to you know, type in evokeendurance.com into the search bar um, to, to locate us. We're on Instagram at Evoke Endurance. I have an Instagram. Finally, someone prodded me and made me get one. So um, you can find me at Coach Scott Johnston. Um, With underscores is, between each, between each oh, word. Oh, that's right. Underscore. Sorry. Thank you. See, I had a little I know about yeah. social media. Um, but the you know, we have trained hundreds and hundreds of people for these kinds of things. And, um, and I think influenced many thousands with the books and articles I've written and things like that. So um, we're pretty good at what we do. Awesome. And we will, I think we can, we can help most folks achieve these kinds of goals. Um, just, and we got one question. Um, but since, anyway, since we have a few more minutes, if you're good with answering it, I'll yeah. hit it. Uh, so how important is it to train with pack weight versus covering ground and gaining elevation. Most of my training is in winter it, ski touring with 20 to 35 pound pack cross country skiing. Yeah. And just for uh, Ben, I imagine you're asking in regards to climbing Denali because I know that's one of your goals coming up. Yeah, I think that both are important. I that's right. Hey, <laughs> hey Ben, how are hey, you? Scott. Good, good, thanks. Uh, um, I think uh, the way we structure our trading is that early on in the base building period, you wouldn't be carrying a pack. You're going to be doing most of, the, of your aerobic you know, endurance type training on weighted, but at the same time, also engaging in a separate strength training program. And then we bring those two things together later in the progression of the training so that then you start carrying a heavy pack. Um, what, what I have found, seen, and, and Maury and I have had this discussion many times about, there's, I be, there's a principle called specificity where you want to train and doing activities that look like your, your sport. So people look at the sport of mountaineering and they think, oh, you're carrying a heavy pack. So I should do all my training by carrying a heavy pack. And I think that's taking the principle of specificity too far. And um, you need to, yes, you do need to have a portion of your training done with a pack on your back and a pack that simulates the weight and simulates the terrain, all of those kinds of demands, but it doesn't need to be anywhere near the volume that most people think it needs to be. In fact, for most of the folks that we work with, it'll end up representing, you know, 10 or 15% of their total training volume on the you know, kind of training on their feet. So it's not something you need to do every day, but if you're going out ski touring a lot and having a pack, there's no real, especially a 10 or 20 pound pack, it's not you know, a huge problem. Yeah, and uh, from my perspective of doing a lot of load carrying, I find a lot of success like doing the like sort of light distance um, aerobic base and then having like a heavier load, especially awkward loads in the gym. I'm a huge fan of sandbags I can just doing get ups or walking and farmers carries with odd loads because that is very similar to the unequal loading you'll experience outside without the injurious nature of the heavy weight on uneven terrain. But I would consider the kind of pack weights you were just mentioning to be kind of low to moderate. Where, where people, I think, kind of go overboard is they think, well, if I'm going to be lugging a 60-pound pack up the West Buttress, yep. I'm going to go out every day with a 60-pound pack. And that, first of all, it has kind of the wrong training stimulus. But then as Maury mentioned, it also carries with it a pretty significant injury risk. Okay. It's not really worth the trade-off. You just don't need that kind of training. We've seen it. We've had great success without using that kind of training. Awesome. 
Oh, thanks, Scott. And thanks, Ben, for the yeah. question. Um, I'm going to end the recording here. Um, I'm going to have to hop off in two to three minutes. But Harvey had a question specific to training for you, Scott.